Chapter 9 Scams and Scandals The secret elite achievements in the first decade of the 20th century were truly remarkable. They took complete control of South Africa's immense mineral wealth, British foreign policy, and the Committee of Imperial Defense. The crowning glories of British diplomacy, Edward VII's diplomacy, were the Entente's which brought old enemies, France, and Russia to Britain's side. The balance of power between opposing alliances was allegedly meant to guarantee peace. It did no such thing. What the Triple Entente, or understanding, actually entailed was never truthfully explained. Ramsay's MacDonald, leader of the Labour Party, later reflected, As a matter of practical experience, the very worst form of alliance is the Entente. An alliance is definite. Everyone knows his responsibilities under it. The Entente deceives the people. It was for the very purpose of deception that arrangements with both France and Russia were created in the loose fashion of an understanding. Observant liberals in the cabinet sensed that the Triple Entente was effectively dragging Britain into the maelstrom of European politics, but no one could mount a serious challenge because Edward Grey reassured them that no formal obligations existed. He repeatedly promised that any decisions on possible military moves would always be left to the full cabinet. In the strict sense of the term formal obligations, he was telling the truth. The secret elite shrewdly kept pen from paper and persuaded the French and Russians to agree to joint naval and military commitments on the basis of the old adage that an Englishman's word was his bond. Edward Grey was thus able to deny they had created an alliance and declared that the Triple Entente had been agreed to secure the peace of Europe. The dirty work of preparing for the destruction of Germany was buried from sight, but continued unabated. The secret subgroup of the Committee of Imperial Defense had been set up with one purpose in mind, war with Germany. To ensure that secret elite's aims were realized, it continually developed and refined plans for joint naval and military action with France and Russia, Secretly, the Committee of Imperial Defense carried forward with great earnestness the plans of war, the plans for war, predicted by several in the know, to begin in 1914. Plans included a naval blockade to deny Germany access to overseas trades and block, per, and block her imports of raw materials vital to war industries. By 1907, accredited naval circles believed that Germany would certainly would quickly be brought to her knees by restricting her food supplies. Sir Charles Otley, Secretary to the CID and Director of Naval Intelligence, prophesied that British sea powers would slowly grind the German people exceedingly small and that grass would soon would sooner grow in the streets of Hamburg. He confidently prophesied that widespread dearth and ruin would be inflicted on Germany. Otley was connected to different influences within the circles of the secret elite and stood to gain handsomely from a future war, some might say disgracefully. When he first took possession of the war office, Richard Haldane learned that direct conversations between the English and French naval staffs conducted on the behalf of Britain by Admiral Jackie Fisher were progressing on a satisfactory basis. What this meant was that progress was satisfactory to Fisher because he was conducting them on behalf of the Navy and he remained in charge. The plans for military cooperation were much less satisfactory because they did not rest in the hands of the War Office. As has already been noted with astonishment, The Times journalist Charles Reppington had assumed the role of chief mediator between the British and French military staff in 1905. The shocking fact is that the Times correspondent remained in a very privileged position within the War Office in the years leading up to 1914. Questions about Reppington's role were asked in Parliament. When a man who has been 
an officer becomes the military correspondent of the times and given a room and access and given and given a room and access to papers in the war office it leads one to think that gentlemen think that the gentleman does not always write what he really thinks to be true no one denied this as a journalist reppington could have penned a sensational scoop he didn't why and he didn't why was he a consultant a reporter or a placement for the secret elite in the guise of both did he continue as the unofficial mediator between the French and British military staff? What did he do to deserve the Legion of Honor from France and be made a commander of the Order of Leopold by Belgium? Why was his role, why was his real role been airbrushed from why has his real role been airbrushed from history? Clearly he was much more than just a humble journalist. Haldane quickly introduced his plans for the formation of a highly trained professional army to fight alongside France. Joint military planning was so intense and detailed that by 1906, senior officers believed that war with Germany was inevitable. Top secret Anglo-French military preparations entailed British and French staff officers reconnoitering reconnoitering the ground in France and Belgium upon which the forthcoming battles would be fought. Britain's Director of Military Operation, Sir Henry Wilson, spent the summer months of 1906 reconnoitering the Belgian countryside on his, on his bicycle, taking careful notes on the lie of the land, canals, railways, railway co crossings and church towers that would one day serve as observation posts. Observation posts. A gigantic map of Belgium indicating the routes armies might follow covered the entire wall of his London office. Sir Henry Wilson and the French general staff shared their deepest secrets. He was sure that the war would come sooner or later and for years labored to ensure that Britain was ready to act immediately. In addition to the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, Haldane set up the ter territorial Haldane set up the territorial army, the officer training corps, the special reserves, and the advisory committee for aeronautics which provided which provided the fledgling aircraft industry in the united kingdom by 1910 he had achieved the complete revolution in the organization of the british army haldane gray asquith and escher retained an iron grip on the committee of imperial defense and created within it an able secretary sir charles otley of the naval intelligence department one of Fisher's placemen on the CID had been named secretary in 1907, and he in turn appointed as his assistants Maurice Hanke, Hanke and Sir Ernest Swinton. Hanke, and Sw Hanke, was Hanke was Esther's chief protege, and the two were in constant communication. He later became a member of the secret elite and close to the circle, the inner circle. Swinton likewise became a member but belonged to one of, of the less central rings. It is beyond any question of doubt that these secret elite agents ran the CID. In 1906, the British electorate had voted, the British electorate had voiced an overwhelming desire for peace and substantial reductions in spending on ornaments, but the secret elite turned pacifism on its head through an age-old weapon, fear. Fear was required to stir the complacency of Edwardian England, 
and counter the anger of workers on poverty wages evidence in strikes and walkouts in mines, factories and shipyards across the land. Fear generates doubt and suspicion. Fear is the spur that has the masses demanding more and more weapons to defend homes and families, towns and cities. It has always been so. Generation after generation has been gulled into paying for the tools of destruction that are in turn superseded by yet more powerful weapons. From the beginning of the 20th century, secret, the secretly indulged in a frenzy of rumors and half-truths of raw propaganda and lies to create the myth of a great naval race. The story widely accepted, even by many anti-war liberals, was that Germany was preparing a massive fleet of warships to attack and destroy the British Navy before unleashing a military invasion on the east coast of England or the fourth or the first of fourth Firth of Forth in Scotland. It was the stuff of conspiracy novels, but it worked. The British people swallowed the lie that militarism had run amok in Germany and the fact that it was seeking world domination through naval and military superiority. Militarism in the United Kingdom was of God, but in Germany of the devil and had to be crushed before it crushed them. When the war ended and all of the plans and events that had taken place were analyzed and, dissect and dissected, were there any naval records found of secret German plans to invade England or for the secret building of more dreadnoughts? No, not one. Rarely have statistics been so thoroughly abused. The secret elite, through an almighty alliance of armaments, manufacturers, political rhetoric, and newspaper propaganda, conjured up the illusion of an enormous and threatening German battle fleet. The illusion became accepted, and historians have written that as fact into contemporary history. These were the weapons of mass destruction of their time, but they could not be hidden from view. In the decade prior to the war, British naval expenditure was £351,916,576, compared to Germany's £185,205,164. Had politicians such as Gray and Haldane been truly determined to crush militarism, there was plenty of work for them at home. The Triple Entente spent £657,884,476 on warships in that same decade, while Germany and Austria-Hungary spent £235,897,978. The, peaceful t the peacetime strength of the German army was seven, 761,000, while France stood at 70, 794,000, and Russia at 1,845,000. Yet the claim that militarism had run amok in Germany was presented as the given truth. Fueled by newspaper reports of massive increases in German warship building, of articles on the dangers to our sea routes, of exaggerated reports in Parliament that the German fleet would soon overtake British naval supremacy, the construction of more and more warships was demanded with patriotic zeal. A strong navy was never a party issue, for food supply and coherence of the empire depended on the British fleet's ability to control sea routes against an enemy. Whatever the cost, Britain had to outbuild Germany. In reality, the subsequent vast increases in naval spending were a response not to be perceived threat, but to the vicious chauvinisms of those bent on the destruction of Germany. 
what made it all so incredibly what made it all so incredible was the fact that Gray, Asquith, and Haldane drove the liberal government into massive naval overspending at the very point where it, where its express purpose was to alleviate poverty and introduce social reform. It was a, bre- a breathtaking achievement. Great ships were built and launched in Germany, but not in the numbers banded banded about bandied about in the British press. Quite apart from the triple on top, Britain alone held such an enormous lead over Germany that any question of a meaningful race was ludicrous. The notion that Britain had somehow fallen behind its capacity to protect her empire was a convenience set to frighten politicians and the people. Like every other modern country with a blossom and mercantile fleet trading across the globe, Germany was perfectly entitled to protect itself. Chancellor von Bulow had stated in the Reichstag, Reichstag that Germany did not wish to interfere with any other country. But we do not wish that any other power should interfere with us should violate our rights or push us aside either in political or commercial questions. Germany cannot stand aside while other nations divide the world among them. Von Bulow correctly noted that Italy, France, Russia, Japan, and America had all strengthened their navies and that Britain endeavors without ceasing to make her gigantic fleet still greater. Without a navy, it would have been impossible for Germany to maintain a viable commercial position in the world. Britain, however, ruled the waves and viewed Germany's growing fleet as an impudent, as an impudent challenge. Impudent challenge. In June of 1900, Admiral von Terpitz had steered the second of two naval bills through the right reach reached Stag to permit an expansion of their navy. He proposed the construction of 38 battleships over a 20-year period to protect colonies, Germany's colonies and sea routes. That's less than two per year. Keep this in mind. What set alarm bells ringing within the secret elite was not German warship construction, but their engineering innovations and merchant shippings that emerged from the dockyards of Hamburg, Bremen, and Wilhelms, Wilhelmshaven. Germany's superior, German superiority in the commercial sea lanes could not be tolerated. The rapid growth of the lucrative commercial fleets of the North German Lloyd and Hamburg American lines was outshining liners built in Britain. For a brief period, the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grasse was the largest and fastest liner on the Atlantic Ocean. This was allowed by SS Deutschland III, which crossed from Cherbourg to New York in five and a half days with a new speed record of 23.61 knots. International prestige was slipping from British built liners. In 1907, the Lusitania regained the blue ribbon, riband, regained the blue riband for fa- for the fastest crossing, outstripping the Deutschland three by eleven hours and forty six minutes. Bigger, better, and faster became watchwords for national one upmanship. The rough guide to admiralty practice had long been based on the notion of a two-power standard, a navy capable of effectively outgunning the combined strength of the two next strongest naval powers. Admiral Jackie Fisher played this navy card to great effect. A conveniently timed admiralty report disclosed that no matter what number of ships British built, Britain built, they could not guarantee the safety of the United Kingdom from aggressors on the opposite side of the North Sea. 
without a change in the quality of design and fire po- and firepower. In 1905, this spawned the first of the dreadnoughts, and in order to scrap old vessels, entire classes of warships were condemned as use- useless. Around 115 vessels that had cost between 35 million pounds and 40 million pounds were scrapped. Astoundingly, 34 of these were only five years old. Fisher wrote confidently to King Edward in 1907 that the British fleet was four times stronger than the German Navy, but we, do not, but we don't want to parade all this to the world at large. The secret elite clearly knew that British naval superiority far exceeded the two-power ratio. But by encouraging Fisher in his manic obsession, the shipbuilding and armament industry conspired with them to reap a rich dividend. This was a falsely portrayed race Britain had to win to survive, and the only way of winning it was to stay further and further ahead of Germany. It was a media coup wrapped in a shipbuilding, shipbuilder's dream. No one but a traitor could doubt the need to be fully armed against the Kaiser's ambitions. Individuals who questioned the validity of the naval scare were dismissed as grumbling pacifists who neither knew what love of country meant nor ever felt the thrill of joy that all the pomp and circumstance of empire brings to men who think imperially. Bully boy tactics turned honest concern into disloyalty in a blatant attempt to crush opposition to the crippling waste of increased naval expenditure. In the midst of this paranoia, a scare story was concocted about a secret German naval building program. On the 3rd of March 1909, Mr. Herbert Molliner, managing director of the Conventry Ordnance Co. was brought to Downing Street to dupe the cabinet. He told them that in the course of his job, he had visited shipyards and armament, arm, armament factories in Germany, and it was it was an accomplished fact that an enormous and rapid increase in armaments productions and naval construction had been taking place there over the past three years. Ten days later, the revised 1909 to 1910 to 1910 naval estimates were published. The allocation was increased by 2,823,200 pounds to 35,142,700 pounds. Despite the concessions, the conservatives under Arthur Balfour moved the vote moved the vote of censure against the Liberal government's naval spending. The proposed increase the propo- the proposed increases were insufficient. The armament armament lobbies the armaments the armament lobby wanted even greater spending. Balfour warned the House of Commons that the margins between the British and German navies would be so reduced that it would result in a great blow to security, which, after all, is the basis of all enterprise in this country. Balfour carried the banner for the secret elite and wrapped increasing spending in words like security and enterprise. He insisted that Germany would have 25 dreadnoughts by 1912, whereas in reality she had nine. Time and again, Balfour pounded home the secret elite's message. More had to be spent on dreadnoughts. Naval spending from 1901 to 1912 in Britain was 456 million pounds compared to 179 million pounds in Germany. A crowded meeting at the Guildhall on the 31st of March 1909 heard Arthur Balfour's address heard heard Arthur Balfour address several hundred shareholders of the armament rings the bankers and the city investors 
A crowded meeting at the Guildhall on the 31st of March 1909 heard Arthur Balfour address several hundred shareholders of the armament rings, the bankers, and the city investors. They drank in this in his every word with dizzy approval. His rhetoric was filled with urgency, alarm, and the dire consequences of indecision. You must build without delay, without hesitation, without waiting for contingencies, for obscure circumstances, for future necessities. You must build now to meet the presence. You must build now to meet the present necessity. For believe me, the necessity is upon you. It is not coming in July or November or April or next. It is now that you must begin to meet it. Balfour's extortion, exhort, Balfour's exhortation had a truly apocalyp, apocalyptic ring to it. It was an end of the world prophecy designed to excite panic. The secret elite press, specifically the Times and the Daily Mail, had fired the opening salvos in creating the German naval scare and their propaganda swept the country off its feet. The summer of 1909 echoed the cry of, we want eight and we won't wait. The propaganda machine turned the catchphrase into an axiom of national insistence. The public demand for more dreadnoughts became, a vehement, became so vehement that the first lord of the Admiralty, Reginald McKenna, who like most of Asquith's like most of Asquith's cabinet, was unaware of the secret elite. Was unaware of the secret elite gave way. He accepted that by concealing its activities, Germany might reach equally in naval power with Britain. McKenna stated that work on four extra British dreadnoughts would begin almost immediately. As a result, the Admiralty was prepared to lay down eight dreadnoughts in 1909. Few stopped to ask how this would affect social reforms and the eradication of poverty. From 1909 onwards, ever greater sums poured into armaments production and preparations for war speeded up. The entire scare was a sham. Moliner had been lying. It was one of the most disgraceful cooked up conspiracies ever known in Britain. What made it so utterly disgraceful was the fact that Asquith Gray and Haldane knew he was lying, yet invited Moliner to Downing Street to convince the cabinet that huge increases in naval spending were necessary. The statistics and so called margins between the British and German navies were grossly misrepresented. Winston Churchill later admitted that there were no secret German dreadnoughts, nor had Admiral von Tirpitz made any untrue statement in respect of major construction. When Molnar threatened to go to the press and reveal his role in the scare, he was bought off and retired to obscurity. Sir Edward Grey was eventually obliged to admit that every line Molliner and the government had peddled was wrong, but the job had already been done. It was a shameful scandal that was quoted in Parliament many times over the next three decades as an example of just how far the armament lobby would go to promote, to promote their own interest. And Molliner, he was easily replaced and airbrushed from history but the naval race is still peddled as a historic event. There was no race. Germany wasn't competing. The massive rise in naval and military spending resulted in an equally massive increase in profits for the shareholders in, arm in armament company companies. Only the occasional lone voice braved the ridicule of a raging press. Lord Welby, former former permanent secretary to the Treasury, 
saw what was happening, and though he had no knowledge of exactly what or whom he was up against, he protested. We are in the hands of an organization of crooks. They are politicians, generals, manufacturers of armaments, and journalists. All of them are anxious for unlimited expenditure and go on inventing scares to terrify the public and to terrify ministers of the crown. Lord Welby all but named the secret elite. These were indeed the men who planned and colluded the wage war. These were indeed the men who planned and, and colluded to wage war on Germany and made profits on the way. And made profit on the way. The average citizen in Britain considered the chief armaments firms to be independent businesses competing in a patriotic spirit for government contracts. But this was far wide of the mark. They were neither independent nor competitive. These firms created monopoly-like conditions that ensured their profit margins remained high. In Britain, this armament ring, or trust as it was known, consisted primarily of five great companies. Vickers LTD, Vickers Limited, Armstrong, Whitworth, and Co. Limited, John Brown and Co. Limited, Camel, Camel, and Laird, Laird, and Co. And the Noble Dynamite Trust, in the last of which the family of Prime Minister Asquith's wife. Margot held a controlling interest. The ring equated to a vast financial network in which apparently independent firms were strengthened by absorption and linked together by an intricate system of joint shareholding and common di directorships. It was an industry that challenged the treasury, influenced the admiralty, maintained high prices, and manipulated public opinion. Competition among British armament firms had been virtually eliminated by 1901. Across Europe and the United States, armament makers colluded in an international combine called the Harvey United Steel Co. to minimize competition and maximize profits. The five British armament giants joined forces with Krupp and Diligen of Germany Bethlehem Steel Company of the United States, Schneider & Co. of Crusat in France, Crusat in France, and Vickers Temi and Armstrong Pazuli of Italy. Pazuoli, Pazuoli, Armstrong Pazuoli of Italy. Harvey United Steel provided a common meeting ground for the world's armament firms and accumulated royalties from those nations sufficiently civilized to construct armor-plated slaughter machines. It was highly successful in maintaining the demand for armaments that were bought by rival governments on the basis that they could not afford to be less well-armed than their neighbors. These trade practices were shameless. Charles Hobhouse, Asquith's treasury minister, wrote in his diaries that an armor-plating ring of munitions manufacturers was robbing the admiralty of millions of pounds of public money by collusion and malpractice. The group charged the admiralty from 100 pounds to 120 pounds per ton per steel that cost them 40 pounds to 60 pounds to produce. He knew, but like many other shareholders in the armaments industry, did nothing to stop it. The armaments trust in Britain had its champions in both political parties, its friends at courts, its friends at court and its directors in the House of Lords and Commons. Its voice was heard in the press and its apostles were in the pupils of cathedrals and tabernacles. The churches were represented on its boards of share or shareholders list by bishops of the Anglican Church.
Anglican Church. The vested interest carried its own vestry of interest. Just as the prophets of war never went to the ordinary people, so the prophets of preparing for war were channeled into the pockets of the private investors. State-owned arsenals, dockyards, and factories like Woolwich were deliberately run down, and five-sixths of the new naval construction contracts were awarded to private firms. Despite the protests from local labor MPs, orders placed by the Admiralty or the War Office went mainly to the great armaments companies whose board seniors military figures regularly sat. With the huge increase in naval building, the shareholders in Armstrong Whitworth were receiving 12% dividends with the bonus of one share for every four held. From the turn of the 20th century, the dividend never fell below 10% on an occasion, and on occasion rose to 15%. Investments in armaments shares provided windfalls for the well-to-do and the influential. In 1909, the shares list of Armstrong and Whitworth boasted the names of 60 noblemen, their wives, sons, and daughters, sons or daughters, 15 baronets, 20 knights, 8 MPs, and 20 military and naval officers, and 8 journalists. Shareholder lists showed a marked connection between armament shareholding and active memberships of bodies like the Navy League, which promoted ever greater warship construction. Armstrong, Whitworth, and Co. shamelessly paid Rear Admiral Sir Charles Otley as a defense director. That the former Director of Naval Intelligence and Secretary to the Committee of Imperial Defense was ever in the employment of an armaments giant tells its own story. Vickers, one of the largest armaments firms in the world, had a similar list of notable shareholders. Vickers and Armstrong were firmly entrenched in the governing class of Great Britain, with senior employees comprising retired military, naval, and civil servants of the highest rank. The armaments firm possessed secret information, supposedly restricted to the, ha- to the heads of the government. Shareholders included the nobility, senior politicians, admirals, generals, and other members of the British establishment who had direct access to the inner circles of power and were well equipped to apply political pressure. Vickers grew through acquisitions of other companies into a vast concern with ordnance ordnance works in Glasgow, factories at Sheffield and Erith, and naval works at Wal- at Walney Island. The London House of Rothschilds was heavily involved in the Vickers takeover of the Naval Construction and Armaments Company and issued £1.9 million pounds of, sh- of shares in finance t- and issued £1.9 million of shares to finance the merger of the Maxim Gun Company and the Northern Nordenfelt Guns and Ammunition Company. Nathaniel Rothschild maintained Nathaniel Rothschild retained a substantial shareholding in the new Maxim Nordenfelt Company and exerted a direct influence over its management. Vickers was launched on the international road to prosperity backed by funding from Rothschild and Cassell. The secret elite held sway at the very heart of the armaments industry. The Rothschilds had always understood the enormous profits generated by these industries. Financing war had been their preserve for nearly a century. Bankers, industrialists, and other members of the secret elite, the same men who were planning the destruction of Germany, stood to make massive profits from it. War, any war, was a means of garnering wealth. Secret elite bankers had provided Japan with high 
interest yielding loans to build a modern navy with which to attack Russia. The greater part of the victorious Japanese navy was constructed by the British yards from which the secret elite made even more profits. Of course the Japanese people were left to foot the bill. And after the Russian fleet had been destroyed at Tsushima, Russia was provided with high interest bearing loans of 190 million pounds to rebuild her navy. Much of the construction work went to factories and shipyards owned by the secret elite, and the cycle repeated itself, with the Russian people left to pay the price. It was no different in Britain. The great naval race produced millions of pounds of profits, and the cost was met by the ordinary citizen. One of the most enduring deceptions perpetrated by the agents of the secret elite was in regard to Italy. It was assumed that as a signatory of, to the Triple Alliance with Germany and, Aust and Austria-Hungary, Italy would have a dangerous naval presence in the Mediterranean in the Mediterranean should war break out. Any comparative naval statistics on the total size of opposing fleets given in Parliament or the press included Italian warships and torpedo boats studiously ignored the irony that British armaments firms owned the very yards that were building those warships for Italy. The British Armstrong Pazuli, Pazioli Company on the Bay of Naples employed 4,000 men and was the chief naval supplier to Italy. The Ansaldo Armstrong Company of Genoa, which belonged to the same British firm, built dreadnoughts and cruisers for Italy even though it was Germany's supposed ally. Rear Admiral Otley was the director of the Armstrong Works at Pazioli. In addition to being defense director of the parent company, Otley. Otley again. The defense director of the parent company. Otley again, how much did he gain from his inside dealings, insider dealings? Vickers was also an important supplier to the Italian Navy through combination with three Italian firms that constituted the Vickers Termini, Terni Co. Both Vickers and Armstrong also held a large proportion of the shares of Whitehead and Co., torpedo manufacturer with works at Fiumi in Hungary in Hungary during the war labor MP Philip Snowden angrily stated in the House of Commons submarines and all the torpedoes used in the Austrian Navy besides several of the new seaplanes are made by the Whitehead torpedo works in the Hung Hungary. They are making torpedoes with British capital in Hungary in order to destroy British ships. Throughout the war, those Whitehead torpedoes were also loaded into the tubes of German U boats and used against British shipping. Numerous individuals sitting in the warm comfort of Westminster or their exclusive London clubs or Grand Gothic cathedrals profited from the torpedoes that sent thousands of brave British seamen to cold graves in the Atlantic. These men made untold fortunes on the products of death and misery. Some of the inner core of the secret elite conspired to make war to their own advantage. Some were simply in the business of providing the instruments of war. Some were mindless investors with no moral inhibitions. Those in the high pulpits who profited from the war while extolling it as God's work included the bishops of Aldane, Aldelaine, Adelaide, bishops of Adelaide, Chester, Hexham, Newcastle, and Newport, as well as Dean Ingle of St. Paul's Cathedral. They formed the legions of God who profited from the legions of hell. 
1921, a subcommittee of the Commission of the League of Nations concluded that armaments firms had been active in the decades before in fomenting war scares and in persuading their own countries to adopt warlike policies that increased their spending on armaments. They were found guilty of bribing government officials both at home and abroad and of disseminating false reports about the military and naval programs of various countries in order to stimulate armaments expenditure. The litany of accusations further indicted them for influencing public opinion through the control of newspapers in their own and foreign countries. The ring was directly criticized for all these activities and not least for ensuring the outrageous price of armaments, but nothing of any consequence was done about it. The secret elite was not identified. Summary Chapter 9 Scam and Scandals The Committee of Imperial Defense continued to host a secret subcommittee that continued to pursue military and naval conversations with France. Richard Haldane at the War Office had to reorganize the military connections that had been left loosely in the hands of the Times correspondent Colonel Reppington, a journalist with his own office at the War Office. The secret elite sanctioned a raft of fear stories and scares to generate the belief that Britain was being threatened by Germany by German naval construction in a race for survival. This propaganda was bolstered by an armament scam that the cabinet endorsed. The opposition of A.J. Balfour's conservative abused and the naval conservatives abused, abused and the naval lobby turned into a clamor for more dreadnoughts. The major British armaments firm formed close associations and partnerships. They made vast fortunes and engaged in national and international trusts or armaments rings that bled government dry let governments dry. Many key figures inside the secret elite gained handsomely from the trade of death, and did many mem- as did many members of the House of Lords and Cabinets and the House of Commons. Even high-ranking churchmen were shareholders in this infamous scandal. British armaments were later to be used in the slaughter of British soldiers and sailors.